said they only appeared to put away their abominations. They only appeared, are you listening to me, to cast away what they learned in Egypt. Many of us, in order to get what we want from God, we don't put away our sin. We just put our sin on hold. Then once the Lord does what we want him to do, we go right back to whatever it was. That's proof that you never came out of it. See, see, instead of putting it away, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. We put it on hold. Lord, I give up this, 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 and that until you do this. Then the next thing you know, there you go. After you've gotten what you want from God, back in your old ways. They left Egypt. But the proof is that Egypt didn't leave them. For I read to you in the text how God said they quickly reverted back to what they saw in Egypt. Can I get a witness? Oh my, so I say to all of us, let us lay aside. Not appear to, but let us lay aside every sin. The Hebrew writer says, and every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us. Praise the Lord. And then run with patience the race that is set before us. You got to really come out. Don't play with it. Don't keep little mementos. Come out. Because if you don't come out, you'll go back. If you don't let it go, It'll come back on you. So Ezekiel said they didn't put away the abominations. Ezekiel also says this, uh, wrote this concerning the event of our text in Ezekiel 23 and verse 8. He says, And neither left she her holotries. Uh, neither left she, speaking of Israel, her whoredoms, brought from Egypt. Why did the people not leave their idolatrous ways? Because remember now, when Moses went down to Egypt land and told Pharaoh to let the people go, the people whom Moses went to deliver got mad with him. See, Moses had to fight Pharaoh and the Hebrews to get them delivered. And they finally came around. That's one of the lost stories that's seldom told about Dr. King. We all love him now, but Dr. King received much resistance from black folk who called him a troublemaker. He had to fight us to help us. You know I'm telling the truth. We don't like to tell that part of the story. Oh, we all love him now. But the man had to fight to get us to come around. Why did uh, the people keep their holotries? Verse 8 tells us why. And he uses the metaphor of a young, abused girl. A young girl who had been abused by wicked men. He uses the metaphor of a young girl who had been sexually assaulted. But she was assaulted sexually to the point that she began to crave and love the abuse. That often happens. That happens quite a bit. Amen. 
The overwhelming majority of male homosexuals will tell you that they were abused as children. Don Lyman of CNN, and whereas he defends the LGBTQ community, will tell you that as a boy he was molested. Praise the Lord. Same holds true with uh, Ellen. And the list goes on and on. It's amazing how abuse can affect a person. It's amazing how oppression affects the oppressed. Ah, the oppression that we've gone through in this country has adversely affected African Americans. Praise the Lord. We're many, 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 many more times likely to shoot each other. Praise the Lord. We oppress one another. The treatment that we claim that we hated is treatment now that we will perpetrate on one another. Won't work together to save our lives. It's amazing the, 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 the price that is paid. Show us in the scripture. Ezekiel 23 and verse 8 says, For she left, neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt. For in her youth, they, the men of Egypt, lay with her. And they bruised the breasts of her virginity. They grabbed, they fondled her tender young breasts. They raped her. She had no say in the matter. For there arose a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. And that Pharaoh enslaved the children of Israel. And they were in bondage for 400 years. And when you are a slave, you have no rights. Can I get a witness? So he describes a young girl who the men lay with her. And they, abru they bruised, that is, they handled uh, her roughly, the breasts of her virginity, and poured their whoredoms upon her. When they finished with her, and this is why abuse is, one of the reasons why abuse is so bad. Parents, keep your eye on your children. And then, parents, don't you abuse your children yourself. It's a horrible thing. What Israel was doing, the psychologist calls it acting out. When you act out, that is a, that is a actual psychological term. Praise the Lord. Do you have a psychology degree? No. But Dr. Ojinga does. Praise the Lord. When you act out, you begin to do to others what was done to you. Praise the Lord. The abuser abuses. The, the, the child who grows up in cussing grows up to cuss. Child who grows up in a home where people smoke, the smoke may strangle them, but more often than not, they become smokers themselves. Then the little girl who's been abused by her father, her brothers, or her uncle, some uvuncular friend, hates the abuse, but in many cases grow up to be quite promiscuous. The little boy, I've talked to many young men who all but cried and some cried at the pain of the abuse that was perpetrated on them by some older relative as he raped them in the night. They hated it only to grow up and crave what was done to them. It's a vicious cycle. Israel had been in bondage 400 years. Now they are free. And what do they do? 
with their freedom, they began to act out. Ah, they, they crave what they had seen. Oh my, you know, it was, you know, it was easy for them to crave the bull and the calf because those were the major symbols of gods in Egypt. Amen. And they'd almost had enough of this invisible God. We're used to a God that we can see. Now those gods that we can see, they had us working in the fields. We were slaves, but we could see them. That's what we're accustomed to. That's why every time they ran into a problem, the first thing they would say is, you should have left us in Egypt. You should have left us in Egypt. All that we were back in Egypt. Praise the Lord. Some of us, the moment the enemy began to come against us, we, we actually would stand up and testify and say, you know, it seemed like since I got saved, since I started to do right, all these things have come upon me. Now, none of this stuff happened when I was out there in the world, but it seemed like now that I'm trying to serve the Lord, th this trouble is happening. You are laying the foundation to act out. Truth is, you still crave what you left. Even though you hated it when you were in it, you crave it now. And you got to let God deliver you from it. It's a vicious cycle. Can I get a witness? Egypt represents the world. And some of us light up when we talk about our past sins. I don't understand it. Yes, yes, yes. When I was out there, I could drink all the liquor. I killed four or five people. I ran all the women. Praise the Lord. I did everything I could do. Saints, I did everything I was big enough to do. Hallelujah. And then the Lord saved me. Now I'm saved now. And I'm in the church. And I'm serving my Lord. But boy, when I was out there in the world. Oh, my God. We used to boogaloo. Man, we dance all night out there in the world. Now, amen, we clap our hands for Jesus, and we give God the praise. I had all the girls. Susie on my right hand and Mary on my left. And had Angie written on my back. Now I'm, you know, married and the wife, she's at home. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I'm just going to be a man of God. But oh, those were the good old days. You're on your way back. You're on your way back to what you left. The moment a degree of pressure comes. The moment life shows up, praise the Lord, you're going back to what you left. You got to let God deliver you. There are lessons that we can learn from this 3,417 year old story. I want to say to you, let the Lord deliver you. Paul speaks of this story. Paul calls it a cautionary example. We are warned of what not to do through this story. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 7, the apostle speaks to this event. He says, neither be ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. I'll explain that in just a minute. But you see the direct reference to what happened. He says, don't be like them. Neither let us commit fornication. That's the reason he brought that in. As some of them committed and fell in one day, 3,000, 3 and 20,000. Praise the Lord. Now he's referencing what took place in Numbers. And then he says, and neither let us tempt Christ 
as some of them tempted and were destroyed as serpents. And uh, verse 11 speaks to us here. Verse 11 says, Now all these things happen unto them for examples that they are, are written unto, they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. What happened then was written for us now. The ends of the world have come upon us. See, one of the problems they had at Corinth was the motto in Corinth. Verse 23, Corinth's motto was all things are lawful. That is, you can live any kind of way. Do anything you want to do. Be as promiscuous as you want and just serve God by grace and still participate in the communion and everything would be just fine. Paul said, oh no, I have a cautionary tale to warn you about. He said, they tried that in uh, Exodus chapter 32 and they got in trouble with God. Verse 12, the apostle says, take heed. Do you see that? Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he falls. The word take heed is an interesting word. It means to look carefully. It, mean, it stresses seeing. It stresses paying attention. I want to encourage everybody in here today, pay attention to your life. Don't walk around blind. Take the blinders off. Look to see. That's a concept that we learn in art class. People who are artists, they look at people differently than most people do because we're trained to look to see. We want to see if, if the distance between your eyes is normal. If your ears are too big, if your head is shaped the right way or the wrong way. Because the artists look at people as though they're going to draw them. So you look to see the distance between the nose and the lips and see if the, the corners of the lips and the earlobes are the same. If they are, you're, you're balanced right. But if they're not, you're off a little bit. <laughs> but they look, praise the Lord, to see. Say amen. amen. The, the, listen, if you think you're doing well in God, the warning is pay attention. Look to see. Because if it didn't work then, it won't work now. Our text says, and I'm almost done, and Moses, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mount, Henry said this, while Moses was in the mount receiving the law from God, the people had time to meditate on what had been delivered. But there were those among them who were scheming how to break the law they had already received. On the 39th day of the 40, the plot broke out of rebellion against the law. Moses was one day from returning. 39 days out of 40 had passed. Just one more day to go. Moses had delivered them instructions from the Lord. And instead of spending their time learning what was delivered, some folk were spending their time counting the days. And uh, they decided that they wanted a God. A tumultuous address which the people made to Aaron, who was entrusted with the government in the absence of Moses, came forth. Here's what they said in a tumultuous way. They said to Moses, make us a God. To Aaron, up and make us a God. Make us a God to go before us. Look at how they were acting out. We want what we saw in Egypt. Many churches today are acting out. That's why these churches look like rock and roll concert stages. 
The walls of the church are black. During service, smoke comes up. Flashing lights. They're acting out. It's the club. It's, it's Golf Brooks. The Ohio players. The tramps. We're acting out. See, we need all that stuff. We want to be reminded of our former days in Christ. Oh, I'm preaching good to you. So now here we see Israel acting out. They're making the, uh, they're, they are confirming that Ezekiel 8, 20 and 8, and Ezekiel 23 and 8 uh, were correct as they acted out. And they said, make us gods. How many did they need? A few weeks ago, the Lord had given them the Ten Commandments. And here they are now breaking the first two. First one, thou shalt have no other God before me. The next one, thou shalt make no graven images. And now here they are breaking the law. Look at us when we get distressed. Instead of obeying God many times, we try to find ways around God. But I want to tell you today, serve the Lord. Not only serve him, but serve him with gladness. They should have been studying and waiting. Instead, they uh, rebel. And notice the, the, the disrespect that they showed toward Moses. Notice how they slighted, how slightly they spoke of his person. They didn't call him the great emancipator. They didn't call him, praise the Lord, our leader. They just referred to him in a slight way. Uh, as for this Moses, notice the disrespect. Notice the lack of caring. As for this Moses, who brought us out, our, out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. They don't, and, and they're not caring. They, they don't, they're not worried. Whether he's living or dead, doesn't matter. Whether he's all right or not, doesn't matter. We don't know what has become of him. Out of sight, out of mind. Oh, they were messed up. So now they said to Aaron, make us gods. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings. Now, uh, have you noticed, praise the Lord, that uh, Aaron did not utter a word of resistance. Aaron did not utter a word of correction nor did Aaron utter a word of rebuke. When they came to him, he folded like a cheap tent. He had no backbone. Praise the Lord. I would name my child Aaron. And if there's an Aaron in here, God bless you. Because uh, you are right. But this Aaron, yeah, uh, who, by the way, by the way, Aaron, Aaron, I hope there's no Aaron. <laughs> I probably can't fix it. Hey man, Doc, your name's not Aaron, is it? That brother stepping out. You're not Aaron, are you? Okay, all right. All right, God. If I know him, he's a good man. I would have felt bad. He's got to go to work. Hey Amen. <laughs> See, Aaron is a lesson. He's a lesson. Aaron was not a part of God's A plan. Aaron, Aaron was a part of God's acquiescing to Moses. It was Moses whom God showed himself to in the burning bush. It was Moses whom the Lord said, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. It was Moses whom the Lord promised to be with. And it was Moses who began to make excuses. It was Moses who told the Lord, I, 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 I can't talk. I have a stuttering problem. I'm not an eloquent man. And by, praise the Lord, Moses' uh, uh, fifth expression of uh, 
uh, of delay by his fifth excuse. God said to Moses, all right, you see your brother over there, Aaron? He's a good speaker. Get him. And he will speak for you, but I will be with you. And so that's how Aaron got in. And see, had Moses just obeyed God, when the Lord told him to, he would have never had this problem with Aaron. The same is true with Abraham. God told Abraham, leave your father's house. Leave the land of your nativity and leave all your family and go to a land where I shall take thee. Oh, Abraham left, but he left and took about 700 people with him. And when he got to the promised land, you see, the promised land was in a famine. You, the, the famine was too severe to feed 700 or so people. So they went farther south and they went down to Egypt land. When they were down in Egypt land, they picked up a young slave girl named Hagar. And when Sarah couldn't give birth, Sarah encouraged Abraham to go into Hagar. He went into Hagar and she had Ishmael. A little while later, God gave them Isaac. And Ishmael and Isaac have been fighting ever since. But had he left the way God told him to leave? All the trouble we bring on ourselves by disobeying the Lord. Some of us, the Lord done made a plan A, plan B, God's own plan Z. Trying to get you to do right. But every add-on is going to be a problem to you. It's going to hurt you in the future. It's going to hurt you. That's why when the Lord tells you to do a thing, you ought to do it then. The Lord says obey, you ought to obey, you ought to obey God. God told you who to marry, but the man God selected for you, he wasn't tall enough. Praise the Lord. The, the, the woman... God selected for you. Praise the Lord. She wasn't light enough. So, praise the Lord, you wouldn't listen. And now, even though you're saved, even though the Lord is with you, oh, there's a lot of heartache, heartbreak, and pain because you wouldn't listen. Now, thank God for his goodness, his kindness, and his tender mercy, but all them scars you got. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.